So. Thanks, Meredith. So if everybody wants to leave the audience, it's time to do it, because she did my talk much better than what I could do it. <laughs> so, yes, thank you very much for being wonderful. And uh, thank you for, um, to all Radcliffe staff for um, doing a fantastic job. I don't name all of them, because I would forget some names. Uh, these... Um, here, this fellowship is incredible. You have made it uh, fantastic for me, really. And uh, thank you for, uh, to Imma, Immaculata, and Alisa for being here. And thank you to my fellow fellow for being a, such a warm and outstanding and challenging crowd. Uh, I've learned so many things, and I will miss you all. So in the next 45 minutes or so, I'll try to use my most poetical language, which is not very good, to try to explain to you uh, what we do in my lab in Paris and what I've been doing here at Radcliffe. So I'm a cell biologist, and as Meredith said, I work in the Institut Pasteur, uh, which you can see here. This is the building which was the home and laboratory of Louis Pasteur in the last years of his life. And on the other side of the road, this is another beautiful building. And this is my lab, uh, pas mal de tout, en français. Um, not bad at all. Uh, it's very inspirational to have a Pasteur home in front of me. Um, so in my lab in Pasteur, uh, we try to understand how cell work and what goes wrong in disease. A cell, from the Latin cella, means a small room. And cells are the basic structural unit of all known living organisms. Each cell is able to function, replicate, divide, and work by itself. And um, it's also able to differentiate in many different types of cells that come together and form different um, different uh, uh, tissues and different organs which perform all the function in our body. Now, let's look at the cell. A cell is surrounded by a membrane, which is called plasma membrane. Cells are not really round. They can have different shape, and each cell is able to extend a different little hair or extension which are called, uh, could be called cilia or little arms that are used by the cell to sense the surrounding. Inside the, the plasma membrane, uh, there is the cytoplasm that is like a thick minestrone soup. So they have all the little organelles here, it's full of little organelles uh, that are little organs because they perform all the function for the cell. In the middle, you have the nucleus, which is the central direction of operation, contains the DNA, the genetic material. Um, and here you have the mitochondria. These are the power station. They make the energy for the cell to work. And here you have the lysosomes, also very important. They are the cleaners. They would uh, uh, clean up the garbage and recycle the goodies, and they are very good at doing that. And here, this reticular structure is called endoplasmic reticulum. Here, this is the factory where all proteins are formed. Now, you can't see the proteins here because proteins are very, very little. And for your reference, if a cell is in the order of uh, nanometers, proteins are 10,000 times smaller in the order of nanometers. So you cannot see them with this microscope here, but you, can, you have to use a super microscope, which is called electron microscope. And then if you enlarge, ideally, you can see that proteins are this little, in this cartoon, of course, they are little dots of different color and little strings that fill all the cytosol. And I'm talking about proteins because they are fundamental uh, work, um, part of the cell. They are the workers of the cell. They perform all the function that the cell needs to survive. And they are very important in the case of neurodegenerative disorders, which, as uh, Meredith told you, um, has been one of the focus of my 10 last year in the lab. So a neurodegenerative disorders have been defined, uh, actually, cause dementia, cause the loss of neuronal cells, which is uh, manifested 
in the patient with the loss of brain dementia. And dementia has been uh, defined by a Nature article as the approaching wave because in the next 30 years, the number of people affected by dementia will, will increase exponentially. And according to the World Alzheimer's Report, Today, 50 million of people worldwide live with dementia, and this number will triple in the next 30 years. This is an unsustainable number, as will be unsustainable for any economy. The amount of money that will be spent for these diseases, which will lead and, and, and overcome the two trillions of dollars in, you, in today. Also. And this fact was somehow known already in 2007 by the US government that define a common enemy, dementia. However, something is wrong. Because although dementia is the fifth cause of death um, in, in worldwide, and, the, and is the most expensive disease to manage because it's a, a, a chronic disease that requires continuous care for many years of the patient that cannot do the very simple function that a human being can do, um, compared to older diseases like cancer and HIV, for example, the funds for research given to Alzheimer, which is the most common cause of dementia and other related diseases, is very, very low. So how can uh, US government spend more than 260, 260 billion on Alzheimer care and give only 1%, less than 1% in research. Um, probably one of the uh, simplest explanations is visibility. While patients affected by cancer and HIV have been able to voice uh, the, the need of funds to uh, find for, for research and the need of funds to find a cure for this, this disease that we now have, in fact, the uh, patients affected uh, by dementia hide out. Dementia is, uh, and Alzheimer's is a, a, a disease of old age. And most of the time is mistaken as a normal aging process, which is not. And family and caregivers are often too tired and worn out to speak up. And this is not something that is unique uh, uh, for, you, for the United States. Uh, this is a recent um, um, uh, example of the uh, comparison uh, on the annual cost for the UK economy on dementia and cancer, and what is given by the UK to these two disorders. It's, 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 it's clear and not comparable. And the uh, adding reads, just 1% toward the cancer research would make breakthrough possible. And this statement has some foundation. In fact, um, if you look uh, again back in the US, the, uh, in this graph, the comparison between federal funding and change in mortality, you see that the disease that like HIV that have received more fundings in years uh, have been able to, to get a huge decrease in mortality. And it's incredible to see the, in, the huge increase in the last five years in mortality for Alzheimer's disease and the, and the little money given. So, and what is more disappointing and depressing is that hundreds of clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease have been terminated because the treatment were ineffective. And the situation is even bleaker than this, because this is to, uh, 2016. Today, many of these trials ongoing have been terminated, some of them a couple of months ago. And from a fundamental um, researcher, like I am, a cell biologist, one of the major causes of the failure of these clinical trials is that we don't know enough about the fundamental mechanism of these diseases. So until we know what happens at the cellular level, at the molecular level, we will not be able to devise a cure. But there is hope. In fact, uh, the, in this graph, you can see that in the last five years, the NIH budget for Alzheimer and related disorders has tripled. And therefore, 
We hope there will be more money, not only for clinical trials and so on, and applied research, but also for fundamental research that will study the cause of this disease. Um, Alzheimer's is one of the most feared disease. And uh, I think the fear of this disease is represented by this uh, slide. In 1995, a um, uh, American painter, William Uther Molen, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and he was 61. And he never gave up his passion and continued to paint until his, his, his brain, his memory, completely failed him. And these portraits are a unique representation on, on what happens in the inner life, the inner life of a person affected with, with Alzheimer's and testify the inexorable progression of this disease. And if you look here, this is his last paint in year 2000. And what is really disturbing is that he lived seven more years until he died in 2007. So Alzheimer's disease is a um, progressive and neurodegenerative diseases that was firstly identified by Alois Alzheimer, a German uh, doctor, in 1906. And what Alzheimer uh, did, um, he identified the pathological lesions that were um, associated, uh, that, that he found actually, in the brain of one of his patients, uh, Mrs. Detter, age 55, when she died. Um, so, and he identified two different uh, neuro, uh, neuropathological lesions. Um, the um, tangles, neurofibrillary tangles, which you can see here in these dying neurons, the cell, the, the, the cell of, the, of the brain, and uh, the senile plaques that were outside the neurons. And what is interesting is that these two uh, different uh, lesions are caused by the accumulation of a pathological proteins. The little tiny proteins that I told you before, well, when they accumulate in these lesions, they cause somehow, we don't know how exactly, the death of the neurons and the loss, the incredible loss of the uh, brain tissue that you can see here in the terminal stage of a, a, a patient affected with Alzheimer's. Now, one interesting thing that I want to tell you is that all neurodegenerative diseases, all of them, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, ILS, Huntington, the prion diseases, are characterized by the accumulation of misfolded, uh, let's say, pathological proteins in different areas of the brain, where they cause these different lesions, different proteins, different areas of the brain, different lesions. So all these diseases are called protein conformational disorders. Why protein conformational disorders? Because, as I told you, when the proteins exit the, the endoplasmic reticulum, and uh, you have to imagine them as, uh, as a string, as a ribbon. So you can fold them in many different ways. However, only one folding, the native folding of that protein, is functional. So only when the protein reach that native state, they can make the function they are made for. What happens in neurodegenerative disorders is that this protein, this string, start to misfold. And they can form what is called disordered aggregates. So they are non, that are aggregate that are non-functional. However, they can also assume a different folding that allows this protein to uh, aggregate one together uh, the other one and to form some uh, huge aggregate that's, that are called amyloid and uh, fibrils. And these aggregate not only uh, are non-functional, but are also toxic, and they cause the death of the neuron and the loss of the brain tissue. Now, the best known of these protein misfolding disorders uh, are the prion disorders, the prion diseases, which are, are caused by the misfolding and aggregation of a specific protein, which is called the prion protein. 
Now, the difference between all these other neurodegenerative diseases and the prion disorders is that prion disorders are infectious. Being infectious means that this disorder, these diseases, are um, transmitted between individuals of the same species or between individuals of different species, like you might recall, like Meredith told you, in the case of the mad cow disease that was transmitted to human beings after ingestion of contaminated food stuff. Now, I'm telling one thing here that is strange, at least sounds strange. When you think of infection, you don't think of a protein, this tiny little thing that is in the cytosol. You think of a virus, of a bacteria, of an organism that has some sort of genetic material that can replicate in your body or in, in pieces of your body and infect you, right? But prions are infectious. Why they are infectious? And this was worked out by Stanley Prusner that uh, uh, got the Nobel Prize in 97. Uh, in a recent interview in the New York Times, Stanley Prusser was, was, was uh, defined the heretical neurologist. Because Stanley Prusner went against a dogma, against the dogma that was telling to us, to everybody, that proteins are not infectious. And he proposed that prion disorders are in fact infectious and are caused by an infectious protein, the prion. This was the name he created. And he demonstrated against the dogma and against many of his colleagues um, that prions are infectious because they exist in two different forms. The normal form, the cellular form, PRPC, and the pathological form that is called PRP screpi. And PRP screpi, the pathological form, is able to imprint the misfolding on the cellular form in an autocatalytic conversion process that leads to the formation of these huge amyloid aggregates. How this occurs is not known, but uh, the polymerization nucleation model is the most accredited model, and I have a cartoon here. You have the, the misfolded form is stabilized in little aggregates that are called oligomers. Now, these oligomers are able to recruit more and more of the normal protein and misfold it, for, find, uh, form the fibrils, the fibrils break, they form again the nucleation uh, oligomers that recruit the normal form, and this is um, a continuous um, uh, pro, um, conversion process. Now, if this conversion process would be limited to one cell, we lose one neuron. I think we lose many neurons, Jeff can. <laughs> but the problem is, that we don't lose only one neuron. The problem is that prions are able to spread like a virus, a bacteria, from one cell to another. They enter the LT cell and they start to seed the misfolding of the normal protein that is continuously produced by the cell. So the question that we wanted to answer, that we asked 10 years ago in my lab, was how do prions move from one cell to another? And this is particularly interesting if you think about the infection from, the, from a mad cow disease. This is an oral infection most of the time. You ingest the contaminated food stuff, the prion, the prion enters the gut, and then this red, red nasty prion here, you, they have to go to the brain. They cannot jump. They have to pass, necessarily, they have to pass between different cells before they reach the brain. And I don't have time to go into details, but what we postulated 10 years ago was that dendritic cells, these very motile cells normally have to patrol the intestine, would be able to uptake the, take the prion and then give it to the peripheral enteric system and then to peripheral nervous system to the, the, to the brain. So, the most, now, now, if you were a prion and want to move between cells, you naturally would use a mechanism that cells use to communicate to each other. So our prion moves, and, 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 and the, the cells need to, to communicate to each other. Because since the, the, the cell theory was, was made and, and refined by Virko of omnicellular and cellular, all cells come from other cells, it was clear that the original proposal by, uh, that the cell was an independent structure uh, was not working, because cells 
need to communicate to the external medium and need to communicate it to other, with other cells in order to work together. So how cell communicate? And Diego has, has made a very simple schematic here uh, that tells us that cells communicate by two uh, fundamental mechanisms. Either directly by contact, so they can exchange things, or at distance. And a distance is, is kind of signaling. So these cells need to communicate something to cells that are very far away. So this cell would secrete uh, a molecule, a protein, or an hormone that would be received by the distant cell that would react. Now, a, a way of distant communication um, through secretion is represented by the synapse, uh, which is the connection that neuronal cells uh, neurons make with other neurons. But in this case, the distance is covered by this long arm that uh, Meredith told you that protrudes from one neuron, it's called an axon, and then reach the target cell, another neuron, or a muscle cell, for example, and at this level, he makes a junction. So the secretion occurs at a very tiny distance, and this makes the communication at distance between neurons to be very, very precise. Because the target cell is just there. So at, this, at, the, at the synapse, the neurons secrete a neurotransmitter, and then this cell receives the neurotransmitter and react. So in fact, uh, when we were trying to understand how prion move, it was proposed that prion move through secretion at the level of the synapse with the secretion and uptake. However, in the lab, we decided to see how could prion move between the dendritic cells, these peripheral cells, until neuron to the neurons. Um, so what we did in the lab, we took the dendritic cells from a mouse, we um, filled them with the fluorescent per, uh, prion particle, red dots, and we co-cultured the cell the two types of cells, uh, in the same dish. And look under the microscope what was happening. And what was happening was blow mining. Because what we saw, indeed, was that these two different cells, the neuron and the dendritic cell, were establishing a sort of channel between them. Um, and through this channel, the prion would move. And here you can see it well in these still images in which you can see a red dot coming from the dendritic cell reaching the new right of this neuron here. And we went on and we, f and we found that uh, between neuronal cells, uh, these channels also exist. And these channels are, are uh, full of uh, prion proteins, as you can see here in this live movie, and this was an animation. And in this movie, when I start, you can see that this particle here, these are two cells connected by a channel, this one here, and, and the particle move from one cell, jumps on a very thin channel that you don't see because the resolution is not enough, and enter the connected cell. So these channels, as Meredith spoiled all my talk, are called tunneling nanotubes. <laughs> but tunneling nanotubes were discovered in culture between cells by uh, Herman Gerders. And they, uh, he proposed that these were very thin and, uh, are very thin and fragile open tubular connections, allowing communication between uh, cells and allowing the, the passage of many cellular components. Now, this proposal was not well accepted by the field because it was going against the dogma that cells do not open up to each other to communicate. They do send signals or they establish synapses, at least in, <coughs> in our body. And, but uh, I thought, this was absolutely true because we could see this channel forming under the microscope and we could see that prions was passing through this channel. So for the last 10 years, we have been working in trying to understand how tunneling nanosuforms, forms, what are the, the molecules, and we were able to demonstrate that as was proposed here, 
we demonstrated that they are open connection, very different from different protrusion, and they allow the communication between cells and the passage of these red dots here that are not prion but are entire mitochondria, the, the power station of the cell. Organelles are exchanged between them. Wow. So tunneling nanotubes are a direct way mechanism of communication between cells and a major highway for the spreading of prions. Why I'm telling you about prions? This is a very rare disease, and not many people get infected by prions today. I'm telling you about prions because in the last 15 years, evidence from many different labs, including ours, have shown that non-infectious amyloid protein that accumulate in other more frequent diseases like Alzheimer, a beta and tau, and Parkinson alpha synuclein share many properties with prions. In fact, they can exist in different conformation, like prions do. They can direct template conformational changes of the normally folded counterpart and form these amyloid fibrils, and they can therefore propagate the misfolding. So the question we wanted to answer, ask in the lab is, are they capable to transfer between cells? And there are very good evidence in literature uh, from the early observation of Eichel a fantastic neuropathologist, that by observing the post-mortem brain of patients affected by different diseases like Alzheimer, Parkinson, uh, ILS, Huntington, and so on, he discovered, looking at the brain of these patients, he discovered that each of these different diseases would start in a specific area of the brain that would be different in the different diseases. But the pathology, that is, the aggregate precipitation that he could see in the brain, the pathology, would spread in a a predictable way because it would spread through connectivity, through area that we know now they are interconnected. So this um, observation would fit very well with the, with the spreading of misfolded protein in the brain. That, so the disease would spread like prions, like prions, like an infection. And this hypothesis of BRAC has been recently confirmed in living um, patients using a very advanced uh, PET scanning and uh, a functional MRI scanning that uh, have led this, uh, this uh, researcher, this is one example very recent, to identify the, uh, in the brain of the living patient with Alzheimer. Uh, the tau aggregate is the same tau that uh, Alois Alzheimer was looking in the brain of Madame de Terre. Um, and what they've, uh, what they've found is that they have been able to correlate the amount of misfolded tau in the brain of these patients with the loss of connectivity, with loss of function of the brain itself. So we asked, how this tau aggregate move between each other? Are TNT tunneling nanotube involved? So we are cell biologists, we work with cells. So we took some neuronal cells, not from this brain, but from a neuronal cell, human neuronal cell, by the way. And we expressed the tau protein in the cells, the normal tau protein. The normal tau protein in green. When the tau uh, protein is normal, you don't see it, you don't see it right? It's very little you see a general diffuse signal that is green. Then we added to this culture the aggregate of a misfolded tau in red. And then what we saw is this. Now, here are the bad aggregated in red that we add. And here in the, in the bottom, there is the culture of a neuron. Now, these neurons are expressing the normal folded tau protein. So this protein is diffuse. You have a diffuse signal. When I start the movie, you will see that this diffuse signal starts, the green signal, start to form spots. And you can see it very well now, very strong. And these spots are diffusing in the old culture. In three days, the old culture is full of these spots. So basically, what we could reproduce in this culture is the spreading, the seeding and the spreading of tau from one neuron to the other 
in, in culture. And then we look, when we looked at the higher resolution, we could see that this tau aggregate would spread through this tunnel. A similar thing, we went to Parkinson. Parkinson is another disease that is uh, caused by a misfolded protein, in which there are misfolded aggregates. And Parkinson is very, is very interesting because in this case, it's really very evident that the, the symptomatology of the disease uh, progresses from periphery with peripheral symptoms, that is the, uh, the, the inability to coordinate, to move, etc., to the central symptom, that is dementia, which is the last, the, last, the last symptom. And this is very well represented by the BRAC stage. In fact, at the beginning, there is only, um, in, in Parkinson, there is accumulation of this misfolded protein only uh, in the brain stem. That, uh, and in the nuclei that coordinate the movement. And then later on in life, uh, the, the, the disease accumulates in the cortex and you have dementia. And this pathological lesion in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of Parkinson are caused by another protein that is called alpha-synuclein. And there are evidence in literature that alpha-synuclein, which form these um, aggregates that are, that, uh, that are called Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites, are moving between neurons in the brain of patients. I can tell you more about that um, in the questions. So what we did, we did a similar thing. We did co-culture, and we could see that this uh, red synuclein aggregate or this green synuclein aggregates were, were inside the tunneling nanotube. And we could do, um, see similar things uh, in the, um, in a, in the uh, um, mouse brain slice, in which you can see these red dots moving between these two neurons. It's not very clear, the movie, but you can see that they are moving through these thin connections, which we presume are tunneling nanotube. So basically, our data support the hypothesis that tunneling nanotube uh, contribute to the spreading of neurodegenerative, different neurodegenerative diseases by allowing the transfer of misfolded protein from the disease cell to naive cells where the conversion would occur and therefore they would uh, propagate the pathology. So, but why would cell do, do this? Why cell would send toxic aggregate to another cell, to an healthy cell? This is suicide, right? So, what happens and what we found is in fact, when you have an aggregate in, in, in a cell, a cell would send the aggregate to the lysosome, to the cleaners. And in the lysosome, normally, the aggregate would be disposed. But if you have a prion phenomenon in which you have a continuous accumulation of this aggregate, what happens, in fact, is that the lysosome are overwhelmed, overloaded with this misfolded aggregate, and then they stop functioning. And so what we found is that the whole lysosome with the aggregate inside is transmitted between the two cells through a tunneling nanotube. It's like the cell that has the aggregate is asking for help to a, 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 a healthy cell and saying, well, I cannot do anything anymore. Can you help? Well, can't help. Because what happens when the lysosome gets to the, to the healthy cell, what happens is that um, this, this uh, broken lysosome um, allow the, the exit of the aggregate uh, from the lysosome, and this aggregate, this pathological aggregate, would, would meet the diffuse protein, the normal protein, and would start the aggregation. And this is the way this propagates between cells. And the last thing I want to tell you about, uh, one last thing about this phenomenon is that any of these aggregated by in prion disorder, Alzheimer, any aggregated protein that we give to normal neurons would increase the formation of tunneling nanotube. So, and therefore, and then this would allow the spreading of the disease to healthy cells. So we, pro we suppose, but we don't know yet, that there is a common mechanism to all, this, to all aggregates that would allow the formation of tunneling nanotube. 
And therefore, we believe that tunnel nanotube could be a potential therapeutic target to stop the progression of neurodegenerative disease. And we are looking into some testing some molecules, but we are very far away. OK, now I told you this nice story and uh, uh, nice movies, but this is done totally in vitro. What sense? Uh, is, uh, has this any relevance for the progression of neurodegenerative diseases? We, we cannot base this on observation made between neurons. So the question is, do TNT, tunnel in antitube, ex exist in vitro? This is not a trivial question. This is a very complicated question because the brain is a very complex network. And Jeff Lichtenhorn can tell you everything. I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm a cell biologist. But what uh, we know is that in the brain of a human being, there are at least 100 billion neurons. And these 100 billion neurons, each of them can make contact with thousands of other neurons, making trillions of synapses in this huge, complicated wiring that contains all our emotion, our knowledge, our thought, the way we walk, the way we, we, we sleep, everything is encoded in this network that changes also with time, so no two brains are the same. And this um, correspondence between the physical connection and the, and the um, action and, and, and the, bra the brain function was uh, uh, discovered, was proposed and discovered at the, at the end of 19th century by Ramon Hikayal that proposed uh, indeed that when you have, uh, uh, for example, in this uh, wiring diagram here, he, he, he proposed that when you have a stimuli coming from the skin and with the neural uh, sensory neuron termination, this neuron will contact another neuron in the spinal cord and this neuron from the spinal cord to a synaptic connection would, co would contact other neuron, reach the cortex, and then from the cortex, the stimuli, the same stimuli, is passed down through the spinal cord, through the motor neuron that will then reach your uh, muscle and get the reaction to the sensory stimuli. But this is a very simple why. So just to give you a, 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 an hint of the complication, these are um, only 300 neurons that have been wired in the brain of a mouse. I told you that we have billions of neurons. So how can we identify tunneling nanotubes in this complex network of connections. And this brings me to my Radcliffe project, which is a project in collaboration with Jeff Lichtman, that is here, uh, carried on by a fantastic PhD student, Diego is also here, thank you for being here, and three fantastic uh, undergraduate, my uh, Radcliffe uh, partner, Rio, Eric, and Alex, who should also be here. Oh, they're there. So, um, so what uh, Jeff is interested in, he's, he's a fantastic neuro, um, neurobiologist, um, is interested in understanding the old connectomy, the old connection in the brain, how cells in the brain wire to each other. And he has devised many different ways to look at that. But the most interesting for us is based, is a connectomic approach based on serial scanning electron microscopy. Why this is, uh, this is the same electron microscopy that I told you is able to visualize the tiny little proteins in, in, uh, in, the, in the cell. So he has, uh, um, uh, Jeff has uh, set up in his lab this serial scanning electron microscopy to, that is able to look at nanometer resolution in a digitalized piece of brain by imaging different sections of the brain that are mounted one after the other so that you can see each cell, each connection, each synapse, each vesicle, each protein inside the vesicle. So I've taken a, a video from Jeff's uh, website to explain what is this connectomic. Uh, and I don't think I can speak on this video because it's really very difficult, but you can ask him how does it work, just for the beauty of it. 
because it's a very beautiful technique. So once you have taken a brain of a mouse in this case, and you fix it and you stain, you start to cut it, cutting it automatically. And then this um, very thin slice here, these thin slices are collected in a film tape, which is then cut in different slices, and then each slice is uh, imaged at higher and higher, higher resolution. So you have the impression that you go inside the brain, and then you can see at this higher resolution, you can see everything is there. You can see all the connections, everything. And you can segment them, and that's what Diego and, and the students are doing, until you get to the volume, a very tiny volume of the brain. You can open up, expand this volume, and reconstruct in 3D each connection at the synaptic level. Synaptic level, wow. That's wow, really. So what we, <laughs> what we um, decided to do with Jeff is to look, to use this connectomic approach to look for tunneling nanotubes. Because then we can see this thin connection because we can see everything, right? And we decided to do in the cerebellum because, for various reasons, but the cerebellum is um, uh, at birth in a mouse. Uh, some cells are not mature, mature of enough, so, uh, finally mature, and so they don't establish the synapse. But what these cells do, these red cells, are able coordinately to migrate uh, horizontally and vertically but they don't have connections. So how do they do that all together? So we proposed, we postulated, maybe they are connected to tunneling nanotube. So Diego went to Jeff's lab, he prepared this uh, with, with the help of his um, lab, he prepared this volume, this tiny volume of, um, of the mouse brain, and started to segment all the cells, all the connections in, in this brain. Okay. And after almost two years of segmentation, this is a tedious thing to do, but it's very rewarding when you find the connection. Um, and the work of many students, of Diego, many students, we found several connections in several cells in the developing brain. And uh, of course, this is very interesting and unexpected, unexpected. Even to us, when we started, we said, well, let, let's try, because you have found something in vitro. You, until you find something in vivo, you don't know. And so it goes against the, and the dogma. It goes against the dogma that cells do not open up to each other. But, and they do it, apparently, they do it in a brain. So in order to convince our peers and and ourselves that this is true, we are doing a, a lot more experiment. This, is, this, this doesn't finish here. There's a lot more to do, but it's a good start. And of course, it's a good start to answer the question, are they also exchanging this connection amyloid proteins, which is what we want, what we want to know. And let me go back in history for the sake of, uh, although I'm five minutes off, um, I told you and that Cajal worked out all the circuit, worked out how through synaptic the cell connect to each other. However, at the same time, there was an Italian anatomist, Camillo Golgi, who also got the Nobel Prize in 1906 with Cajal, but they didn't talk to each other. No, because, because Camillo Golgi was old fashioned and he was convinced that in fact, the neurons would somehow form a reticulum. The neuronal cell would be connected in a reticulum to each other. So each piece of brain would work together because the cell will not communicate to the synapse, but will be basically one body, one reticulum. Because he could see this staining that he was using, diffusing from one cell to, a, to another. Now we know that Cajal was right, but in light of what I told you, the question is, was Camilo Golgi maybe somewhat, somehow right as well? And then I want to tell you my little secret that is not my secret, but it's a secret that I borrow from this, this um, book, the, the Little Prince, uh, that has accompanied me since I was a, a kid. And this little secret is very simple and tells you it is only with the heart that one can see rightly what is essential 
is often invisible to the eye. And this is the most important slide. This is uh, thanks to my lab that are giving all their heart in this work that this is possible. Thanks to all the student postdoc uh, researcher I have in, in Paris um, that share with me the passion for science. They understand that the way, the path to discover is, is made of very small steps and very few ha-ha moments that will fill the rest of your life, of course. And thank you to Diego, who is somewhere here, uh, my partner, and of course, this wouldn't have been possible without uh, the collaboration uh, of Jeff Lickman, who has opened the door uh, to his lab, to this crazy project. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.